Um, the next speaker uh, is uh, uh, the Department of Cambridge University and all visiting uh, at the uh, Institute. I happen to meet uh, during an interaction with the project EPC UK has identified data moments of change, time sensitive generated country. What happened to you interacting with uh, on social mood changes detect that and she has been with many uh, starts in mental health parts one of which the one is the vast uh, of india and uh, i am wanted to actually the reason she is much uh, in some field related parts probably her experience uh, would be helpful in collaborative aspects of the specific context of mental health. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this is going to look a bit strange because I have an EEG headset on my head. And if you excuse my rudeness, I'm just about to record my brain activation data uh, just in a condition of high stress uh, while giving a talk. Um, so I'm a neuroscientist and I do nerdy things. Um, but thank you so much for having me, uh, South Carolina local time uh, and anyone virtually elsewhere. So I'm based in London, UK, here in Westminster. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and also to listen to the previous speaker and really resonated the points, especially towards the end. So um, what I would love to try and do is um, sort of minimize redundancy with um, the information that I'll provide, but also um, maximize the, the knowledge exchange in a high level uh, in terms of, yes, I will focus on bots, but I want to also look at uh, the broader space of, of digital mental health, because of course, bots interact with coaches, bots interact with other things. So I want to kind of uh, have a focus on bots, but then be able to explore other spaces. Um, what I won't be doing in this talk is covering in great depth specific RCTs or uh, reviews of um, chatbots within digital mental health. A lot of this is uh, open access, so I just encourage you to read these things. What I want to do is bring you thinking that might not be in the mainstream, but is certainly uh, in the forefront of digital mental health on the ground, uh, in the front line. Um, and yes, so my goal really is to just try and get you to be thinking about some of these issues around safety and particularly around the word integrity, uh, which is, I guess, the legacy I'd love to live, uh, leave behind in my career, just that we, uh, this space in mental health is very precious and we have to protect it. Uh, right, so let's begin. So it's kind of a very dry slide, I apologize. I just shoved all my affiliations in there. Um, but just to say, I am an academic. I've been in academia for 20 so years. Uh, I, I've published, I work with publishers, I work with special issues. Um, I think for this particular talk, the two things that are most relevant are that I'm a co-investigator on an NIHR funded grant, uh, looking to do an RCT on the chatbot WISA. Um, and also, um, I run a conference every summer. Normally, it's in the precincts of uh, Westminster Abbey here in London. But for now, to be safe, we're doing everything virtual. And if ethics in your work that you do um, is, is of interest, please get in touch because we can arrange a pre-recorded talk or a topic that we could uh, discuss in digital mental health innovation. Um, Advisor to Wiza and just a bunch of other stuff, um, which I won't really get into. Uh, but how I see mental health and why I think it's so precious and it needs to be protected um, and standards have to be the highest um, is I, I've just been working with big data. I've been working with people and it's just it's really fascinating to see all the different ways that you can come at mental health. Um, and so my background is neuroscientist, so I do apologize for my headset while I record my brainwaves, but um, I got to play around. It's a Friday afternoon and it's a nice weather, so I'm going to be quite relaxed. Um, 
but yeah, my background is neuroscience, but I quickly uh, transitioned it into other areas, as you can see. And the last sort of five, six, seven years, uh, digital technology has just been fascinating to me. And of course, my passion for social justice, for hip hop, for uh, even astronauts need mental health care. We, um, yeah, I, I'm all over the place with this stuff. So um, I, I hopefully I can answer any questions. Uh, but I want to focus uh, on safety in particular, and I can't do justice to this topic in such a short time, but at least I can plant a few seeds and maybe give you some examples that inspire you to go explore. Um, and then, of course, integrity. Uh, some of the work that I'm doing when I work with different providers, so I work with over 100 different providers, uh, is showing that we're stronger together. So I'll come to that uh, a little later on. But yeah, safety and integrity are two things that I really want to pioneer and, and support. Um, so the last thing I want to do before diving into it is slightly indulge in uh, sharing some of my work in maybe a minute or so. Um, it is not a chatbot per se, but it has a lot of um, similarities uh, in terms of uh, potentially offering automated therapeutic support um, and uh, t like text generation, showing the importance of words and how words can be powerful um, and also how listening can be powerful. So these are a lot of commonalities with, with chatbots um, and just the free text uh, component to a bot and allowing someone to be able to say how they feel and express themselves in ways is extraordinarily powerful. So uh, from free text to freestyle, I just wanna borrow a minute of everyone's time to show how we use words to help uh, try and make people feel better. And it does to me resonate with chatbots, but uh, in brief, there was a hip hop artist who gave three live performances and the song lyrics involved suicide in a very positive light. And after these three performances, time series analysis showed that uh, increased uh, calls to the crisis lines for suicide support and decrease in actual suicides. So on a public health level, you can see the power of words to, um, to do good. Now, this is, this is actually called the Papageno effect. And when you're designing chatbots and, and the words, the scripts, the uh, non-scripted words that come out of bots, think of these two things. The Papageno effect is something that can induce a positive contagion or something that can lean to a positive outcome. The Werther effect, uh, which has been existing in traditional media and social media, uh, this is when, for example, a suicide is mentioned and too much is mentioned about the method of suicide or other factors that lead to a negative contagion and an increase in emulation of suicides. Uh, so Werther effect, Papageno effect, when you're thinking about chatbots, I, I think it's really important, um, especially because it scales. So this uh, situation can be very good or very bad. Um, in terms of uh, what we're doing here is we have keywords. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, we have the ability to control these keywords. When someone freestyles into the uh, app, we have a rhyme detection algorithm that gives a score. If you use those keywords, you can increase your score. Um, but this can have a therapeutic effect, which we're exploring in uh, preparing for an RCT. Um, and um, yeah, so again, just to emphasize that you are in a position of influence with words, and this can have a direct impact on well-being and mental health. So chatbots, free text, anything that's interactive is, is potentially extremely powerful. Now, I won't go into this again, but I, I just to, to highlight from the previous speaker where things can go wrong and disastrously wrong uh, for social justice, um, holding back social change and just a lot of things. So I won't uh, go into that again, but the angle that I will come at it from is um, I was reading something a while ago in 2013 and the person wrote that they were feeling suicidal and they were thinking about jumping off a bridge. And that was Siri's response in uh, 2013. Now, as tragic as that is, um, time has moved on. Task bots, social bots are different from digital mental health bots. Um, but we still have to be so careful because we're still seeing, even within the medical um, area, that the bots are are, are still uh, doing some really scary, dangerous stuff. 
Fortunately, this is a fake patient, so that's um, lucky. But at the same time, we just have to be extraordinarily careful before we uh, deploy things in this space. It's so precious. And on a, a positive note, in terms of positioning a chatbot, and this was uh, touched upon with the previous speaker, this is an example by the Trevor Project, where uh, they've done a really good job at positioning this chatbot in a safe way. So it's not directly facing users who are seeking support. It's used as a training bot. Uh, so the Trevor Project, for those who don't know, this is the world's largest suicide prevention um, organization for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and here they're just using uh, some really nice uh, approaches, human driven approaches to position the AI so that it can maximize um, the, the technology, but in a way that's safe. So looking at transcripts that are based on role plays from counselors and the organization staff. Language is so important when it comes to mental health and when it comes to suicide prevention and sexual orientation of LGBTQ+, we need to remember that they are disproportionately impacted and at risk. So the language of how to speak uh, in these spaces about gender identity and about even mental health literacy, it's so crucial that humans uh, are playing a role here. And I would also argue for the work I do with hip hop, drug term trends and the words that's used, it's just completely different from what you would see in a clinic or scraping out uh, in, in other sources. Uh, so this was just a really nice example and it illustrates the importance of setting strict limits. We have to, um, and you'll see another example later on where uh, it becomes a law that uh, technology cannot just be used to assess um, sectioning of the Mental Health Act. So just because we can, it doesn't mean we should. And I think this is a really excellent example where it's been positioned, the, the bot has been positioned well. Um, now, I'm guessing that some of you I'll, probably a lot of you actually for this audience uh, are, are familiar with legacy bots and uh, dad bot back in the day and that kind of thing. Uh, so digitally reincarnating people or having people train up their digital data uh, before they themselves die. Um, it's quite a heavy uh, topic to be thinking about, um, but I could see that it would serve a purpose um, for many. But again, when we take a step back and look at this from a mental health perspective and an ethics perspective, it immediately jumps out that this isn't going to work for everyone. And in fact, I would argue uh, that we need to do research and examine certain cases, for example, complicated grief, someone who's experiencing complicated grief, how would they feel uh, using uh, this, this bot? And the reason I talk about complicated grief, which is just persistent grief that over time might actually lead to uh, comorbid psychiatric conditions, meaning it could lead to a diagnosis of depression, a diagnosis of anxiety. Why is this so important? Because technology in part uh, can be very addictive and complicated grief. Uh, I'm just gonna show you one research study here, a functional magnetic resonance imaging study. And what they did here was look at a group of complicated grief participants, which you can see in the, the green box. And they contrasted this against non-complicated grief group. And in this study, they asked participants to, um, to look at words that were uh, grief versus neutral words. And in the, oh, let me back up a bit. Both groups had brain activation in the pain uh, regions, the pain pathways in the brain. And this is not surprising when people are grieving, um, this, is, this is painful. So we see this activation across both groups um, in, in this space. But what is unique to the complicated grief group, which is vulnerable to comorbidities in the psychiatric illness, is that it also activates the reward system, which I mentioned with technology, there's always a risk of the dopamine um, rush, that type thing. Uh, so we see increased um, activation of the nucleus accumbens in this group, uh, the complicated grief group, and actually a deactivation in the other group. So we're seeing here this interplay or internal 
conflict, this neural conflict between the pain center and the reward center. And I love the second bullet point, the quote um, from this person. It's as if the brain were saying, yes, I'm anticipating seeing this person and yet I'm not going to see this person. The mismatch is very painful. So the nucleus accumbens is all about anticipating reward, whether that reward be the chorus of a song or seeing that person that you love. So I think we just need to, oh, sorry, and because I love hip hop, uh, any Kid Cudi fans out there, I think he just summarizes it so well. People say that bad memories cause the most pain, but it's actually the good ones that drive you insane. And I think that just sums up all of this. But um, so just going back to this legacy bot and just rushing into these concepts, we need to be very careful because not everyone is the same on the outside or even inside and how we respond physiologically to, to the creation of uh, chatbot innovation, we have to consider all of this. Uh, so on a slightly lighter note now, um, Wiza, so I am an advisor to Wiza. Um, I've been working with Wiza for... Um, almost six years now. Um, and yeah, it's just been a very interesting journey to start from something so small and then uh, figure out how to combine AI and ethics, uh, inclusivity and other things along the way. So uh, I didn't get sign off in time to actually share specifics. So I'll have to just give high level things, but um, currently we're doing, uh, this is the first NIHR funded um, NHS RCT. So I can't say too much except that we're uh, getting close to getting ethical approval and getting all of that work underway and, and, and sharing a protocol paper with, um, with people. And, but there is other RCT uh, preliminary, it's either accepted out, um, that kind of thing, showing a significant improvement in uh, helping depressive symptoms. Um, other research that uh, we're just submitting now is looking at maternal mental health and depressive symptoms, uh, and uh, statistically significant improvements in that space. There is other research as well um, that is ongoing and, and previous, but what I wanted to talk about from this perspective is I come from a background where I work with big data and I often work with information where I know almost everything about someone or an awful lot, genomics, brain imaging, uh, even at one point social media, uh, just deeply personal things through um, clinical interviews and things like this. So it was a very big transition to switch to data minimization um, anonymity, putting privacy and trust and protection first. And it was very enlightening to switch to that and to, to work within a space where someone feels comfortable expressing um, their, their concerns or their, their personal narratives in that space. Um, and then, sorry, just to go back there quickly. Um, and it was also, it's been very interesting to see the contrast between an RCT design and even things like randomization algorithms and, and considering that more structured space versus more of these real world observational studies um, against that backdrop of having lots of data. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting, really interesting journey. And so what I wanted to just um, do really is while the focus might be on chatbots in for this audience, I want you to be thinking of chatbots while I talk about these other concerns or ethical areas in other spaces of digital mental health, but realize that chatbots will be, I think the next generation will be embedding more and um, there's gonna be a lot more integration across uh, the, the spaces. So one interesting thing in terms of peer-peer networks, especially anonymous peer-peer networks, which you could argue chatbots in, uh, when they're working directly with a, a vulnerable person are protected against as long as they're um, screened very carefully with, for clinical safety, uh, that they don't have the issue of predators uh, where people will um, masquerade as a young person and try to groom and offsite an individual, so a human predator, um, or the other perspective where a young person has taken on the responsibility of being a peer and they don't have training, it's very poor, and they come across someone who is trying to groom them and they are not protected. There's no duty of care to protect the person trying to, to care. So there's always these trade-offs uh, with 
advantages of maybe a bot approach, disadvantage of peer, vice versa. Uh, and there's also these integrations and uh, points of innovation, but also we have to be careful with the ethics. Um, another area is, uh, of course, telehealth and online therapy. Uh, therapist verification and fake therapists. This is where bots could start to play a role in terms of um, exploitation of acting like a therapist or um, cybersecurity risks and all kinds of things like that. But just stepping aside from that, um, there is an increase in concern that uh, because there's no regulation or um, certification of therapists in many many countries, um, that the quality of care uh, is, it's at risk. And so we need to be thinking about uh, how technology and other ways can be used to support um, the uh, establishment of technical tools, etc., to help with um, verifying anyone in a position of care. So again, bots, from one perspective, they don't necessarily have to worry about that human factor of uh, someone giving inappropriate care or exploiting someone. Uh, but then again, there's a lot of interesting things to unpack with bots and cybersecurity and things. Um, uh, yes, again, so uh, bots, lots of uh, ethical issues in that space, uh, metaverse, web three, all this kind of stuff, wearables, I won't go into the details of these things, but uh, even synthetic text generation, this can have a very positive um, play or play a, play a positive role in digital mental health, but again, it could be exploited for bad purposes, um, and perhaps chatbots could be trained on synthetic text generation in a safe environment, but then you have the risk of not having, uh, you might have biased um, data, um, and then contrast that against, well, sometimes events are rare in mental health, so you could always uh, boost the data by generating more data. So there's a lot of trade-offs here. I'm not saying right or wrong for any of them, but just teasing apart and thinking about bots in a greater context. Um, Digital therapeutics, of course, music therapy, and as I mentioned before, uh, sectioning under the Mental Health Act. So again, I'm, I'm really going broad with the, the talk here because I just want to build awareness around the work that you do. Um, and as I mentioned before, just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. And I feel this way for legacy bots. And I feel this way also for uh, if someone is being sectioned under the Mental Health Act, which we have here in the UK. So when the pandemic started, a lot of uh, a lot of free reign was given by FDA and uh, lots of governments to uh, get your foot in the door and bypass certification or uh, other processes and get going with digital mental health, uh, telehealth, et cetera, across the board. Um, and this also included remote assessments for uh, potentially sectioning people, um, vulnerable people. And so while that was fantastic for enabling broader acceptance of uh, telehealth, uh, it it was really difficult to, um, to to handle this issue of potentially sectioning someone over Zoom and that sort of thing. So it was raised um, as a potential legal issue, and the, the law stepped in and said that it was unlawful to do so. Um, so I do think that again, just because we can, it doesn't mean we should. And mental health is one of those spaces where innovation driven by technology can be okay uh, and wonderful, but I, I, I just, I'm very cautious to, to not put the human in front of that. Um, and I really like this quote from one of the, um, the people in this article, can you complete an adequate assessment given the enormity of decision, essentially taking away someone's liberty? And that's why ethics comes into play taking away someone's liberty uh, versus quickly jumping on Zoom. It, it's to speed the pace. Uh, we need to slow down and think about what's happening to the human um, in, in this situation. So again, just to emphasize safety here, I could just go on and on. I'm writing a book on ethics of digital mental health and safety, I could just answer that, talk about anything. Um, but I'll just switch to integrity and um, looking at how in digital mental health, there's a bit of a movement and I'm really excited about 
helping with this movement where providers can be stronger together. I don't necessarily think this is happening outside in other sectors like the financial sector or other spaces in big tech necessarily, uh, but in digital mental health, we're, we're, doing, we're taking some steps to be stronger together and to build ethics, safety and security uh, early on into providers. Uh, providers care. So uh, I'm only showing this briefly just to show that um, when the pandemic started, we had we brought together 50 plus providers and they had a, a collective user base of upwards of 50 million people around the world from which we grabbed snapshots of data insights, be it chatbots, be it uh, you name it, telepsychiatry, peer networks, etc. And so from that, uh, it was very clear that the supply and demand of digital mental health had shot through the roof. It's, it was just um, excellent, but also comes with huge risk for cybersecurity. So I wanted to just touch on safety briefly. And uh, this is very much a, a chatbot thing, as well as all kinds of um, provider um, approaches. So the the first project I just wanted to bring attention to, and one of, there is a chatbot in this project, uh, but we want to look at API security and what does good look like. So we have over 10 providers, uh, but now that I work with 100 plus providers, I will branch out slowly um, and we're going to start looking at what does good look like in this space and how can we ensure um, that API to backend is it's it's holding this, the sensitive data where it should be and it's not leaking to places it shouldn't. So do, yeah, trying to look at what does good look like. And I won't go into too much detail, but I feel like I've got a little bit of leeway to get um, a little bit heavy with the API stuff, um, given the, the work that you, uh, the space that you work in. Uh, so as you know, um, APIs are used for apps communicating with apps and systems. And yeah, over 80% of the traffic is API out there. And it's really, really uh, important for interoperability and helping with um, care and, and sharing of, of data. Um, but at the same time, it comes with uh, huge risks and challenges of protecting the API space and malicious traffic after the uh, pandemic uh, it grew a lot more, 211% versus non-malicious API calls. If you're interested in API security, um, just let us know because we're working together to uh, lots of providers, including chatbots, to um, help with this space to create standards. And again, um, good news in this space, we are, again, providers coming together globally and trying to address this issue of unqualified therapists who are exploiting. And, and I can imagine bots in this space will need to be thinking about cybersecurity, chatbots, and, and all kinds of stuff. So um, I, I will stop there uh, because I think there's going to be probably questions that are more focused on the chatbots. So just to say thank you. <laughs> thank you again.